Now I request Professor Gregory Scolier to please take over. Uh, I lost a few of you. I'm so sad. <laughs> I, I won't get paid if, actually I'm not getting paid, but I'll get fired if, if you don't all show up. So, uh, you know, I need to... <laughs> no? I don't know. All right. How are you guys doing? Are you going to fall asleep after eating lunch or not? Yes? yes? yes. No? Yes. I'll make you do exercise. I work in Japan a lot. We do gymnastics every hour or so. So we'll, we'll do, uh, I do yoga. We could do some poses and maybe get our energy flow, you know? No? All right. Um, so hopefully you have your piece of paper. We're going to have you do a few more things with your concept. Um, um, we'll, we'll answer some of the questions that we got. We have a Q&A session at the end of the, uh, this particular talk. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to answer some of those questions um, then. One, I, there's one question that I'm going to address uh, because I don't think you were listening. I never said that only technologists are innovators. Did I say that? In fact, I think I said the other thing around, right? We can be very innovative as management students or business students or anyone, right? Musicians, you pick the field of study, you can be very innovative and then you can reach out and find, if you need technologies, not every business needs a technology innovation, but if you do need it and you don't have the skill, you can reach out to find someone to help you with that, with that arena. So yeah, you don't, need, you don't need to be a technologist to be an innovator or an entrepreneur. So I thought I'd nip that one in the butt, as they say. All right, I'm gonna wait just a few more minutes till, till everyone gathers. Um, are you learning, are you, are you learning anything yet or not? No? Yes, one thing? If you learn one thing, then I'm happy. Two things, I'm ecstatic, but I'll just go, I, I'll accept one thing, that's, <laughs> that's the most, you know, we have to learn a little, Every day I get up and I think, what am I going to learn today? So hopefully you guys do as well. Now the back row back there, how you doing? Can you see me? Yeah? Okay. We ended up, where did we end up? What were we talking about? We were talking about drivers of drivers in operating models and we're looking at both revenue and costs, what drives revenue and what drives costs. And we're gonna look a little bit deeper, you know, for all you finance students in here, every decision we make. And so when you start your, your business and you make a decision, you should write down on a piece of paper or on a spreadsheet if you're truly a finance wonk, on a piece of paper somewhere or on a field somewhere, write down, here's my decision and here's the numeric impact of it. I'm going to buy 100 units of X. I got 100, put that down, and I have X, whatever it is, and how much it costs. Every decision you make ends up somewhere on your financial statements, whether it's your income statement, your balance sheet, your cash flow, it's gonna be there somewhere. And you don't have to be a finance person to know all this stuff. You just put it down, go ask someone to help you if you don't know how to do it. They'll help you figure out what the right bucket is, and then away you go. But the reason you want to write them all down is because um, how, how many times, you, you've heard the story of Thomas Edison and his light bulb, right? How many revisions and tests and experiments did he make before he came up with a light bulb? It's probably, you know, urban myth, but, it, you know, this thousands. Your business model will go through thousands of changes. So it's nice if you get your basic hypothesis written down and the key, the key me metrics that are going to change down. So when you change it, you just go change the number and you see the impact on your financial statement. So do it as early as you can. Business models used to equal financial models. They, they, that was the same term. We've started to separate them a little bit uh, t 
to try to elevate the business model as more of a mental framework and a mental picture of your business that will change. And in fact, the business model validation process, as you test your assumptions, the business model validation process uh, helps us hopefully avoid starting a business with mistakes. And when you're validating, when you're actually operating, it's expensive and you can lose money. So hopefully with the business model validation process, you're able to pivot through your business model variations until you land on a business model that hopefully will work for you um, when you launch. All right, so document your assumptions, write them all down. Anything you decide, A or B, you, you know, you're, you, you wanna write it down. All right, so let's look at how we might consider the cost drivers and then how do, how do they line up with our strategy? So when Ryanair, ever, does anyone know Ryanair? Have you heard of Ryanair? Ryanair is like the spice jet? Low cost airline? Indigo? Indigo. Ryanair is like a flying bus. It's nasty. It's just crowded and there's no service and it's uncomfortable, but it's cheap and it gets people from point A to point B uh, very effectively today. Uh, they've, they've turned into a very good business model, but when they launched their business, when they launched their idea, um, I, I can't hear myself, guys. And I'm really, I like to hear myself, because I think I'm, I'm wonderful. No. So uh, when they launched their idea, there was this firm called British Airways. Everyone heard of Brit British Airways, a big, big air carrier, and they have their business model. And there was another firm called Aer Lingus, which is an Irish air carrier, a national airline of Ireland. And then there was these guys, these brothers, the Ryan brothers, who started Ryan Air. And when Ryan Air started their business, their only route was from Dublin to London, from Dublin, Ireland to London. That was their only route. And their business model was this. Our customer are gonna be business travelers. British Airways business model was our customers are business travelers. Our service is full service to our clients. Onboard meals, uh, you know, uh, ticket agent office, the whole thing. British Airways, same thing. Full service to their clients. Ryan Air said, well, we're going to adopt the US, at the time, the US low cost carrier model, which is more efficient than these state run operations. Both Aer Lingus, the Ireland firm, and the British firm were based on state-owned models which aren't particularly efficient, a lot of labor, a lot of inefficiencies, lots of air, different airplanes. And Ryanair said we're gonna have one airline, one airplane, one route, it's got 44 seats, and uh, so it lowers our maintenance costs, it lowers our capital costs because we're only buying one plane. Um, and so that was their go-to-market model. What do you think of their go-to-market model compared to British Airway? Same customers, same service, more efficient operating model. What do you think? Good? Good launch strategy? Raise your hand. Is that a good launch strategy? Ryan, let me give you one more piece of data. Ryanair was going to go to market at 98 Irish pounds. And British Airway, on average, when they gave discounts and some, some others, the best they could get to was about 140 Irish pounds. So good launch strategy? Bad launch strategy? Okay. Their business model did not create any differentiation, right? It wasn't differentiated. There was no disruptive component to their model. It was just operationally effective. They were better operating in their, in, in their airline maintenance and their airline purchases. Where there was a, they were doing the same thing but better than British Airway. Who's got more money between these two firms? What can British Airway do? Because all of you are going to have this worry. I'm a little company and I'm starting up and there are these big animals out there who could, in a minute, if they care, turn a switch, spend a few bucks. They don't care if they lose money. 
and put you out of business, right? They had no real operational uh, differentiation. There was no operational innovation. It was operational effectiveness. When you start your business, you need to look really closely at what you're doing. Are you just doing it better or are you doing it different? That can create some advantages. They went after the same customer, same business model, full service, more or less just doing it differently in the operations side, right? They kind of woke up and said, we can't do this. There just so happened to be about 750,000 passenger or potential customers who were taking a ferry boat from Dublin to London. And they were spending about 45 pounds to go from point A to point B, and it took about eight hours. Ryanair woke up and said, wait a second, our market may not be business carriers. British Airway has those guys already, but I can do the route for 50 pounds and take all those passengers who are taking the ferry boat. And their, their world changed. So if your business model, as you're looking at designing your business model, but now I gotta look at my cost drivers. How do I get to 50 pounds and make money? Because at the end of the day, if they can't make money, they're gonna go out of business, right? So cost drivers in the airline industry. Aircraft leases, the more planes I have, the more expensive it is. Big cost driver. Labor is a big cost driver. Who's the most expensive labor? Pilots. Maintenance facilities, huge expense, especially if I have a lot of types of airplanes. Every airplane that's different requires different kind of maintenance and so on. Call centers for customer service and help and support, and obviously fuel price is a big cost. Ryanair, after they woke up, they actually, after their first year of their launch strategy, which was really just operational effectiveness, they were more efficient. Their plane was always full. British Airways was about 70% full. That was an advantage, but it was operationally effective, right? They said, well, we still, we want to build our business model still on one airplane, so reduce maintenance, bulk purchase discounts, because if I can buy, instead of one route, if I buy a lot of airlines, the same plane, I can get a discount on it, so that's a big advantage. And they can pick new airplanes. If you wonder why airlines struggle, it's because they have old airplanes. And so those firms who are buying new airplanes, they're operating costs. In particular, if fuel is my biggest expense, if I can get newer planes that are more fuel, have more fuel economy, then I have an advantage, right? They targeted regional airports instead of the the, the larger airports that have lower landing fees. And one of the things that Ryanair does is they, if you, if you actually get on the airline, you know when you're on an airplane, they have those little pockets in the seat in front of you? Ryanair does not have pockets in the seat in front of you. Why would they not do that? Why would they not have pockets? But yeah, because if I, got a, if I have a pocket, then junk's going in that pocket. And then my cleanup crew has to go and empty all those pockets. If they're not there, you got to deal with your trash yourself, right? Because most people don't just throw it on the ground. Most. Every once in a while, right? Um, and then they're on, they were, they're entirely online. They got rid of, they got rid of all their ticket agents. They got rid of all their food service. They got rid of all that high-end stuff. And they only focused on getting passengers on, getting them off, low, low cost planes. Fast turnarounds, their planes are in the air three hours more than their competition. Every, every hour your plane's in the, in the air, you're making money. Every hour it's on the ground, you're losing money, right? Low cost strategy. When you have a low cost strategy, as we saw in the positioning grid, I've got to look at all the activities and what drives the cost. Look at the cost drivers, and then how do I go attack those, whether it's with technology or business practices, right? So one way we can look in an industry when we're trying to figure out how do we deal with attacking an industry is we look at the industry, define the cost drivers, understand our position if we're looking at a cost advantage, and then go attack them with a, with a, a strategy for each of those main drivers. So Ryanair has done that very well. All right. Oberoi, does anyone stay at the Oberoi? Nice place? They have beautiful hotels, right? Beautiful hotels. Luxury hotel industry, do they want to be a, are they cost focused? Are luxury hotels cost focused? 
Not really. They, I mean, they don't want to waste money, but they don't, they're, they're trying to create what? A great environment, not a good environment. They want a great, if I'm a luxury hotel, it's not about good. It's about, it's about the best experience you'll ever have in your life. If I can create that for you, you're going to come and you're going to come back. Right? And you're going to tell your friends, you know, if you're ever going to take a vacation, go to the Oberoi, right? Have you ever, you probably haven't heard, the most profitable hotel chain in the world is called Choice Hotels. Have you ever heard of Choice Hotels? No one has, unless you're in the U.S. And you wouldn't stay there. They're, they're really low-cost hotels. And you can get in there in the U.S. on average maybe $50 a night or $40 a night, which is pretty cheap in the U.S. for, for a hotel room. What's a big cost? What do you think the most expensive thing in a hotel industry is? What's the bit where you might lose the most money in a hotel? Maintenance, food, food's close. What's that? Electricity. Yeah, but I gotta have electricity, right? I gotta have it. Empty rooms. Yeah, occupancy is a huge issue, right? I want occupancy for sure. I heard someone over here? Service. Yeah, so it could be. So Choice Hotels provides no service. Choice Hotel does not have a restaurant or uh, any kind of space for catering or for events or any of that stuff. They have no, brec they have no food. They, if, at best, they have a little lounge area and they have a, a little coffee machine and you can go push some button and get some coffee if you want. They got rid of everything that's a variable cost that is only going to be used some of the time. They just got rid of it. No chefs, no famous restaurants in their space, none of that kind of stuff. So their price point is low, but their profitability is high because they always have occupancy. Right? If I'm always full and I manage my cost to the point and I have a price that helps cover that, and I'm always full, I'm a happy hotel owner. right? And the other thing Choice Hotel does, which makes their, they're a franchise. Do you know what a franchise means? So, a fran so with a franchise, someone else operates and runs and takes profit, and I give, there's a, a, a license fee that they pay me for the rights to do that, right? So what they do is they franchise their brands. They have seven different brands. And they don't care if one is fully occupied. They put their brands all right next to each other. And what they care about is maximizing the occupancy of their brands, not of a single unit, not of a single uh, hotel. So the franchise person is mad because they want full occupancy. That's how they make money. But Choice Hotel doesn't care because they just are trying to maximize across the brands that they have. Right? <laughs> Cost leadership in the hotel industry is one direction, but Oberoi doesn't care about that. Oberoi is trying to be on the other end of the spectrum. They're going to focus on things that drive revenue and what are the key drivers of revenue in the hotel industry? Luxury amenities. What's the customer experience like? How well trained is the staff? And what kind of food, food service, and food options might I have available to, to them? I used to go to a uh, hotel in Shanghai, the Portman, Portman Hotel. The first time I went there, I walked into the hotel, and I walk up to the the reception, and they greeted me by name. They said, welcome, Mr. Collier. I hadn't checked in yet. A little scary, right? But they knew, based on my travel itinerary, when to expect me, right? They knew that I was, my plane was landing, and I most likely would be taking you know, the, a cab or a car from, from, the, from the airport to the hotel. So they knew when to expect me. OK, I could figure that out. That's pretty good. Right? I mean, kind of nice, but not impossible. So I check in, I go up to my room, and as I go to my room, the cleaning maid who was making sure the room was ready came out and was walking down the hall, greeted me by name. That's even more scary, right? <laughs> so I can imagine in the back of my mind the training that's going on as every morning they're looking at who is the staff, who is, who is attending. How are we going to treat them? Who's in which room? So on and so forth. So now let's, so I was checking out. I called to check out and I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm checking out. And, and uh, the concierge said, 
Uh, well, would you like me to check your business travel partner out as well as he going to be leaving at the same time? I'm like, what? He knew that I was traveling. I had a colleague who I was traveling with that most likely would be checking out with me, right? This is service. This isn't good service, right? This is great service. And when you start to look at revenue drivers, you know, if I want a luxury experience, would I be willing to pay for this kind of experience? Of course. And it takes systems and potentially it takes technology and processes in order to do that. And the Oberoi does these kind of things. Really, they're the best brand in the world when it comes to luxury hotel services. You know, they've, they added in particular in some of these, uh, some of their properties, they, they add all kinds of things and amenities that really drive uh, specific to the, the location that they're in, but they may add swimming pools or billiard rooms or any kind of activity centers if it's family oriented. Uh, they have the best dining experiences that you can get in their hotels. Their spa services are better than, I mean, if you've never done a spa service at the Oberoi, treat yourself once, you'll, you'll think you've died and have been reincarnated. So um, their training is similar to what we have with Portman. And then their facilities are designed specifically. And they do some really cool things, like bring in technologies to make all of these additional services even better, maybe uh, solar or different kinds of technologies to, to drive, the, drive it in new and unique ways. Because you have to have heating, you have to have cooling, you have to have lighting. These are things that you have to do for your consumers. How do you do that in different ways that can be in line with the experience you're creating for your brand? If my strategy is differentiated and increasing willingness to pay, then I need to focus on revenue drivers. All right? So I think I asked you at the, at the break to write down what kind of cost drivers you might be focused on for your business. Um, maybe you want to write down one or two things that you think drive revenue that might be a revenue driver for the business that you're in. You may have, because your strategy may be to increase willingness to pay. Increase willingness to pay translates into a higher price, but it also translates into higher costs, right? Oberoi's costs are gonna be higher than choice hotel costs, right? Because they're making decisions, they're making trade-offs. Choice makes the trade-off for cost, Oberoi makes the trade-off for willingness to pay, right? All right. Last, retail. How many of you have retail? Does anyone have a retail plan? They want to sell something? A product, like a consumer good, anything like that? No, no retail. I love retail. Oh, one, good. Retail's fun. Retail makes people happy, right? Why do people buy stuff? They buy stuff they don't need just because it makes them feel good, right? I'm going to buy 10, 10, 10 pairs. I love, I have like 50 pairs of shoes. I don't need 50 pairs of shoes, but I like them. You know, it makes me feel good. Retail is interesting. When we think of retail, the cost drivers in the retail industry, floor space, rent, and then we have labor intensive activities. So if you're in food service, right? One of the biggest, one of the big cost drivers in food service is how much rent or how much you pay for your space if you don't own it, right? And in a restaurant, you want to pay no more than 7% of your cost of your revenue should go to your rent. But a lot of times, uh, if you're in Boston and you have maybe a room that's this size, yeah, maybe slightly smaller, but about this size, it might cost you $25,000 a month just to rent the space. So I got to sell $25,000 or whatever food I have just to cover my rent. And then I have labor costs. So if I'm in retail, I got my space up, I have a store and I'm selling magazines or if I'm selling whatever. And then I have labor activities. I got clerks who maybe show me the products or I might have a cashier who's gonna sell and take the money and I have all these other labor intensive things. So in, in retail, we have space and we have labor, two big cost drivers. So this kind of cool company called Zoom Systems. Now I'm gonna talk about how we can start to apply technology to create maybe a different world and the experiences that we're creating with our, with our industries. And they came up with these Zoom systems. I don't know if you've, have you seen these kind of kiosks in, uh, 
in the airports at all? I don't know if they've, they've if they've, if you've traveled internationally, I know in the U.S. there, and I've seen some in Europe, where they have these kind of, they're kiosks. What do you normally buy when you, when you see a kiosk or a vending machine? What do you normally get? Coke, right? Cigarettes maybe, I don't know. Do they sell cigarettes here? Uh, no, I hope not, yeah, they do. Chocolates, candy, right, you see candy. So vending machines have typically been considered in our mind as something that we would distribute kind of low cost products, right? Because maybe we're afraid if someone breaks into them, they'll steal something, or well, I don't know what we think, right? But what they've done is designed this vending experience, it's a retail experience that's a very small footprint that creates the same kind of retail experience you might have if it was a full store. And so you'll see like the Bose headphones or the Beats maybe. I think that you'll see these in here. Uh, in this case, you have a high-end kind of makeup counter as opposed to going to a store to buy it. You can go to the kiosk. And in the kiosk, there's lots of different things that they've started to add that makes the experience like retail. So they got robotic services, uh, both in their software and hardware, that help deal with the vending pieces. Actually, when you, when you select the product, it doesn't charge your card, you can use a credit card to pay, and it doesn't charge your card until it senses the product has left the machine. Right, because everyone's had that experience when they put the money in for their candy bar and then you're like shaking the machine because it doesn't come out, right? And so they're trying to deal with this, right? Because they, they have to think through the use case scenarios and how do I make sure my customers are always happy? I'm not gonna charge them until they have the product. So they put sensors and things like that inside of the, of, of the machines to make sure they do that. You can put higher value products. The problem with vending machines is you got cheap products in here, it's hard to make money, right? On a vending machine, if you're selling 50 cents a dollar at a time, I gotta sell high volume traffic in order to make those make money. I can put higher valued products inside of these, these kinds of vending uh, experiences or new re let's call them new retail experiences in order to let those become more popular. And in fact, Sony and Motorola both are making a commitment to use this kind of machine as their only retail operation, not having stores. Reducing their footprint cost and reducing their labor cost by having a new way to experience the purchase of these kind of goods, right? And, but you know, there's still service. How do I charge people? I gotta collect money. What if they want to know, I mean, if you buy something, a lot of times at the higher end value, you want some information about it, right? Which one should I pick? Which color should I pick for my skin type? What, you know, what level of technology do I need to buy if, it's a, if there's different options, right? And so the services in the centers, they can have information services just like going to YouTube or whatever, and you pick and you can get the information you need on the products that you want right there at the kiosk, right? So this is a way Zoom Systems is looking at creating a new retail experience by disrupting the way we think. We call this a new set of performance attributes, and I'm gonna talk about this in a second. But we have this old model, this old retail model, where customers think this is how it should be done, and we have this set of attributes that describe it, like square footage with sales staff and labor force, and now I create a new set of attributes that have different sets of performance that we can expect, and that is a way we disrupt the industries we're interested in. So what we want to do with operating model innovation, right, first is some industries have huge costs and there's ways to deal with those costs by eliminating them entirely by doing things differently, and that may be what's key to driving your business model. Depending on your customer segments, you may have a segment that really is interested in more of a luxury or higher end experience, and so then you're going to be focusing on those revenue drivers and spending the money that creates that experience that you're hoping to achieve. And then sometimes we can look at technology or mechanization as a way to transform an experience in places you wouldn't typically think about. These are the ways we start to look at attacking our business model in new ways. And it's not just, technology has a, has a piece of it in many cases, but sometimes it's just understanding the drivers and how do we look at those in very different ways. I would challenge you, and I'm gonna give you an example. We're gonna talk about Uber here, I think, next, right? Maybe. Yes. 
we can talk about Uber next. Um, and how do we look at subsystems of your business, of the business experience, to identify where these opportunities might be? And I'm going to have you think about the, the kind of assumptions you're making and the subsystems that might be in the business that you guys are, that you're, you're focusing on at the time. One of the things we want to do, business model on innovation at the operational level can create sustained competitive advantage. We want to not just create an advantage that's easy to copy, right? It's one of the reasons I don't like to talk about revenue model too much because pricing strategies or how we collect revenue from someone is really easy to do. There was a company called Shanshan Industries uh, in China. They're a big gaming company and they, they wanted to, uh, Actually, they're, they're, I don't, do you guys know the product called Second Life by any chance? Did anyone ever do Second Life? Yeah, a few. Some of us tech, yeah, we were weenies back then, right? Second Life was an online experience where you actually go online, you can live your life, and you actually bought stuff. And uh, I think there was a million dollars a day being uh, exchanged on Second Life online for, for a period of time. You had your own house, you had whatever, whatever you wanted, right? It's kind of like there was a Sims. It's kind of like Sims. Um, so they wanted to do that, but they couldn't find a market for it. So they, they saw this company in Korea that had a kind of a gaming experience, uh, kind of a battle experience. Uh, you know, I don't know what they call it, MMEs, the big uh, massively competitive online kind of games. And so they took it and copied it. We call this analogs. If you're looking at starting a business and you don't have really have a good idea yet, copying what someone else does is a good idea, especially if it's doing really well. And if it's not in your market, why break your brain coming up with something brand new? And I know I think your chief minister might argue with me a little bit on this one, but you know, if you're looking for space, there's, there's no re reason to ignore what works. So what they did was they, they copied a game from Korea. They created the characters, they shifted the characters and made them all popular Chinese historic characters that the market knew. They were familiar with those characters through stories and so on, like Mulan or whatever, right? And by doing that, it created, they had an instant market, they had an instant affinity to these games, and it became very popular, and they used to charge a subscription fee, just like we see with a lot of gaming, where they would go on and charge, uh, you know, for getting on to use the, the game. Well, after a while, they were very successful. They started to become very successful. All the big competitors said, oh, there's this market in China, and this company is doing really well. We want to go in there. Competition is a great thing. It tells you that there's opportunity, and there's money there to be had. That's, you know, if there's no competition, generally it's because it's probably a bad market, right? So when competition comes in, it's a cool thing, but you've got to be ready to respond to competition. Revenue model is the easiest thing to change. First time subscription. Competitors come in, they have a subscription rate. If you want to lower your subscription price, you're just losing money, right? If nothing else changes. So then they say, oh, let's do in-game purchases. We'll stop subscription prices. We'll do in-app purchases or in-game purchases. That's how we're going to charge our customers. And so they did that and they created their, they continued to have an advantage, but their competitors did in-app purchases as well. Easy to do, right? Then they said, wait a second. We can't keep playing this game. We'll lose that. Eventually, they're bigger than us, the big uh, global competitors. Even though they had got to about $3 billion of revenue, they said, OK, let's do something really different. We want to be Disney. We want to be the Disney of China. Because we've created this strong affinity to our characters. And people are willing to experience our characters, not just in games, but maybe in hotels and in movies and on cruise boats and whatever, whatever, right? And so they shift their entire business model and their revenue streams from not just being a gaming company, but from being this big mar marketing uh, kind of global, global uh, Chinese and eventually global brand company, just like Disney. And that's harder to copy, much harder to copy. So revenue models are easy to copy. Operating models, if you do them well, are very difficult to copy. And so that's why if we want to sustain competitive advantage, we need to be looking at how do we create that advantage at the operating side. You can do some things with revenue model, but it's harder to uh, sustain. All right, so let's look at, is it Uber? I got the wrong, I don't know. yeah, let's look at this. It should say, we're going to look at Uber, but we're going to look at uh, subsystem 
kinds of analysis. So, so anyone taken a taxi? Has anyone gone to New York by any chance? Has anyone been to New York City? No? Not yet? It's my, I was born in New York City. I love it. But the worst thing in the world, I don't know, you can tell me, is taxi drivers in New York City. Are, are taxi, do you have taxis here, right? What are, what are they called? Um, autos, right? Autos? Are they great? Is it a great experience? It is. She's not here. It's great. Why do you like it? You're a glutton for punishment? Do you like to hit your head against the wall, too? <laughs> yeah, taxi, taxis in New York are just like hitting your head against the wall. You open the door and they swear at you. They may or may not turn on the meter, right? Uh, if you don't pay them in cash, they'll, they'll swear at you again. Um, they may not take you. If you say, oh, I'm going to, you know, from the Upper East Side to, I want to go to Soho, down, down the city a little bit, they'll say, no, nah, I don't want to go there. And on and on. I mean, it's just a nasty experience. Is that a little bit like autos? Complete, was it? Complete, same thing? Right. They must have learned from New York. <laughs> or maybe New York learned from there. I don't know. But it's a, it's a terrible experience. But why could they get away with it? Why could New York taxi drivers get away with such a bad experience for the consumers? And the consumers just put up with it. Why could that happen? Do you know why? I don't know how it happens in India. But in New York and in most cities around the US, the only way you were allowed to have a taxi is if you bought a medallion. You had to buy this license, basically. And if you didn't have a medallion, you couldn't be a taxi driver. And there were only a limited amount of medallions that you could own. And so these companies would buy all these medallions and they would lock out the market. So their, their comp competition was zero. And their, their service was terrible because they didn't care. You had to take the taxi, take my taxi or walk. I don't care, or maybe you can get on the train. Deal with that, right? So the service was horrible. So what we want to do is, now I'm looking at the industry. Now your industries may not be as horrible as the taxi uh, industry, but it's probably similar, right? There are, there are things that are in place in the, in the industry structure that create the reasons why it's performing like it is. And you might say, I want to do better than that in this industry. So how do we do that? Because don't build a new, you know, I, they didn't, build, you know, Uber didn't say, okay, I got this software, I'm gonna to put it together this, this billing tool and this map thing and whatever, whatever, whatever. Now let's go figure out what I'm gonna do with it. That's not what they did. They probably did something like this. And this is what I'd like you to think about. On the top, on your page, across, underneath wherever you are, right, subsystem, the problem, traditional approach, and the in a, your innovative approach. Just write that down. And on the side, just write subsystem, you can have S1, S2, and if you're an S engineer, dot, 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 SN. <laughs> right? You can tell, you, you'll figure out what your subsystems are. I don't know what they are, but you figure out what they are. And what I want you to do, and I'm gonna go, go through an example here with the taxi system and what Uber has done, is look at what is the subsystem, what are the problems that subsystem should be addressing, and what's the current approach in the industry? The last column is our answer, is our approach, we'll, we'll, we'll not worry about that. But what you'll want to do, maybe not now, but at least think about it as we go through an example, in your industry that you think you want to enter, what, is the, what are the subsystems? How is, what problems is that subsystem addressing and how is it currently being addressed? Let's take a look. All right, so, we have a little stretch problem here. So this would be a subsystem on, on uh, meeting, meeting presentation technology. All right, so we have a subsystem. This one's ordering a ride. So the first part of this, the subsystem of taxis is how do I order a ride? And so the problem is how do I get, how do I get riders and taxis to find each other? Right, how do I make that happen? That's the problem I'm trying to solve. Who's going to pick me up? Do I care or not? Um, you know, a lot of times we went out kind of more or less what a fair price is, especially 
You know, if you've ever gone to a foreign country and you get into a taxi cab, you know for sure you're not paying the right price, right? You know for sure. And, uh, you know, are cars available or not? So in getting a ride, I've got these problems that getting a ride should help solve. The traditional approach in the U.S. is you either go to the taxi stand and wait for a taxi to show up in the rain, in the snow, in the heat, in, in well, I don't know about here, but yeah, it gets hot, right? And I wait and wait and wait and wait and wait sometimes. I had to go to the airport and I waited for like three hours, it felt like, because um, I had called, I could call a taxi, but the, when I called them, they didn't show up. Well, they didn't call me back and tell me they were gonna show up, they just didn't show up, right? And there's no, there's, so this is the current approach, right? So Ubers, you know, if we look at the subsystem, and we'll have a grand reveal at the end, but in, in Uber's model, when they order a ride, they've got this GPS system, they got some technology, right, that shows you where the car is, and it shows them where you are, and it shows you where you are, or you can even move to where you want to be, right? Uh, you can locate near drivers nearby, you can estimate the fare and how long it's going to take you to get from point A to point B, you can even do it with a group, right? You can, you can do whatever you want, right? You can book and cancel, and they let you cancel once, I think. And you can, they also send some information about the type of car and who the driver is in their ratings, right? So Uber's innovative response to the problem of how do I order a ride? And we compare that to the traditional response, and we start to determine kind of if this is gonna create some value or not. The next one, taking a ride. So taking a ride, the problem is the driver, you don't know the driver, he doesn't know you, right? The taxis are old and dirty, and there's a reason I put in red, the traditional approach, the, most taxi companies have a fleet, right? They own all their cars, they're the ones with the medallions, they buy the cars, they have a fleet, they don't maintain them, they don't wanna spend the money. They wanna, any money they make, they wanna keep as profit. This is a cost driver. So I put a red around this. In this industry, the taxi fleet is a big cost driver in the taxi industry. They've gotta spend money, they gotta maintain them, all kinds of things, right? And they also have to retain their drivers. So I hire drivers as subcontractors. They come and pick up the car wherever I have the fleet and they take them out for a ride and so on, right? So that's the current model. Uber does it differently, right? You have, do they, does, does Uber own the cars? No, they do not. I, mean, I don't know about India, US they don't. Most of the world they don't. The drivers own the cars. The drivers own the cars. That's Uber's approach on dealing with a cost driver. Hmm, if I don't own the most expensive asset in this industry, might I have an advantage? Let's figure out how to solve that problem, right? And that's what they did. By getting individuals to sign up, and they have a driver's license, and they have some background checking, hopefully. Uh, the driver hopefully has a clean car, because he wants to be rated well, so that he can get more, more, more rides from other people. And then they have the routing system, and they have some other stuff that goes on, and they, they try to train them. I don't know if there's competition here in India, but in uh, the US we have, uh, another brand called Lyft, and we have a couple other brands because Uber's kind of got a little rep problem going on. And so uh, Lyft, they're much more, they're much nicer. Uh, they try to make it like a social ride. It's a little weird, but I don't want to talk to my driver. I just want to get, get there, right? But so they've created taking a ride as a different approach, and a big part of taking a ride is they don't own the cars, and it's a huge cost advantage. So let's look at, we'll see why that com how that comes to play in a minute. Paying for the ride is another big problem, right? In New York, again, if you don't have cash, they're gonna yell at you. And I gotta deal with it. And I don't even know if I want the drivers to have cash. If I'm a driver and I got a lot of cash in my car, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen if I got a lot of cash? Yeah, someone's gonna rob me. Drivers hate having cash. They like it because they don't have to report it but I, they don't like it because someone else is gonna steal it from them, right, potentially, all right? The other problem is, you know, I don't really want you to split your fare, just, you know, here's my fare, it's $10, pay it. Um, 
And then the consumer is not really sure, should I tip these guys or not? Uh, the taxi drivers always tell you, if you ever go to the US and you take a taxi, they're gonna tell you, oh yeah, 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 yeah tip me 30%, right? No, nah, I don't tip me 30%. The traditional approach is the cash, now almost all the taxis have credit cards in it, right? So how do I deal with pay for card in, in Uber? Uber says, well, I'm gonna deal with this problem in maybe a different way. You know, you load your credit card information on the app, you never pay for the ride, right? It's just done through the app. Uh, you get to rate your drivers. You, you get to, to split things if you want. You can even do Uber Pool. Do they have Uber Pool here? Yeah, it's awesome, right? If you like, do you like use it as a social thing? Meet friends in Uber Pool and meet somebody? No, 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 no. All right, but you can record all the information and Uber does track all the information as they're going through, so they have an idea of what's happening and who, who you are and where you tend to go. It helps them understand how many drivers they need to hire, how many, how many they have to have out on shift during a particular uh, kind of uh, hour of the day, right? The last thing I want to touch on is the driver for the ride. How do we pick and select the drivers for the ride? And traditionally, the problem is, you know, they have to figure out how to find passengers. Most drivers, and this is a big problem when it comes to the medallion, when in a taxi service, the drivers are hired and they pay the company to be able to take the taxi car out and go generate revenue. So the taxi driver is like burdened. They gotta pay thousands of dollars just at the beginning of the week to take the car out. Big problem. They have to handle credit cards, deal with cash and so on. And the traditional approach in kind of getting the drivers to either wait in line as we talked about earlier, um, they're paying their fee uh, to, to get the medallion rights and they're dealing with cash and all this kind of other issues. And so Uber says, let's deal with this differently. We're gonna manage, we're gonna find and manage our drivers and green box, I now have a revenue driver. The revenue driver is to one of your stakeholders, the driver, and how do they make money? They get 80% of the revenue from the, from the ride. In the traditional model, they're losing money. I mean, they have to work really hard to just pay for the medallion, right? In this model, they own the car, they got some other things that are, that are their cost structure, but they're getting a bigger piece of the pie than they were in the traditional model. Big issue, right? Which gives some incentives. In fact, most of the Uber drivers were ex-taxi drivers, right? So these are the kind of subsystems that happen inside of any business or any industry. And the subsystem is, what's the major area of problems that the industry is addressing? And it's easier to do, in, it's easy to do with a services model like a uh, taxi service. And then what are the key pieces that go on? One thing you can do is create a process flow of the current industry, and you just go up and you say, you know, I don't wanna do this process at all, let's get rid of it. Right, that's a, that's a way to start to design a new business model by attacking areas that the industry is inefficient. I was working with a guy at uh, Boeing. One of the most expensive things to do on an airline is maintenance. Maintenance, you go through the airplane and you have these, you have to high paid experts who have to go and look at the electronics or the uh, you know, whatever the aviation systems are, you've got computer systems, you've got hydraulic systems, you've got all kinds of technology inside of an airplane, and they have to go through and approve the airplane and make sure it's ready to fly. And he drew out the system. It looks something, you know, the maintenance system for checking an airplane. And then he started, he, he, he said, wow, all of this, there's lots of manual processes in it. There's either labor, there's literal manuals of, you know, I gotta go to this manual to figure out how to fix this part or do, you know, go through the process of what I have to do. And he, after he drew this out with his concept, he started to X out every one of them. There's only one or two bubbles left. His solution was using uh, kind of a smart glasses. And as he was walking, looking at the airplane, back in the service center were experts. So I only need one expert. And as he's walking, they see what he sees. And if he sees a problem, or if they see a problem, up will pop a repair manual, or the, the specific repair procedures for that part. And literally took 
about 90% of the cost of repairing an airplane out just through this integration of technology. By looking at the subsystems and thinking very differently about how to solve those problems. And this is, I, I would propose to you as you're looking at your own businesses, as you look down at the traditional approaches and the subsystems for your own businesses, start to think about how do I deal with these in new and different ways and what's their rationale? And I, I can guarantee you, you're going to start to come up with extraordinarily bus uh, great business ideas that are going to be meaningful when you start to take them through any venture process, whether it's with ITE or whatever you have here at the university already, uh, where you can start to get people excited about what you're trying to do. And that's where you can get funding. So if you're worried about trying to get, get funding, is if you're showing these kinds of solutions, it can make a huge difference, right? All right. Um, do I want to talk about this? Nah. Let's talk about this. I like Netflix. Movies are much more interesting. All right, is anyone a binger in here? Do you guys binge? Who binges? Yeah, a couple. The only two, come on, only three people binge? No way. Yeah, honest, let's be honest, right? Everyone binges. Everyone binges. I mean, you have to, right? After exams, man, you know, you got a weekend. You're in between semesters. You haven't watched a TV show for a month. You're going to binge. So Netflix. Netflix. Is Netflix a technology? <coughs> Netflix is interesting, right? I'm gonna t I want to put you in the way back machine. I want to put you into the time. Did you ever have to rent like a, a DVD? Did you have a DVD? How many of you had to rent a DVD? Most of you? How about VHS? Did you ever rent VHS tapes? Now you're not that old, right? So if we go back into the Wayback Machine and we're Blockbuster in the United States, we're a Blockbuster video, but in India, I don't know if you had a, was there a big brand here? Yeah, what's that? TCS? T-Series. Got it. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Well, in the U.S., what happened was great. Blockbuster video, I mean, before Blockbuster video, it was probably more or less like the structure in India before Netflix, where you had a hugely fragmented market. Thousands of players who rented videos in your local area, and you just wandered over there, walked around. They had a, a small selection of product, and you get your video and, and go away. Blockbuster saw this problem. And they said, I'm going to solve this in a, a different way. Blockbuster said, we're still going to be a retail store, brick and mortar retail store, but we're going to sell Blockbuster hits. Because people want those latest and greatest movies. That's what they want to see. This is pre, you know, TV series binging. You know, life has changed. Huh? Five. No way, five. Five, you want me to end in five minutes? Can I have 10 minutes? 10 minutes, please. Thank you. I'll take 10. All right, so, so Blockbuster said, I'm going to do this differently, right? So let's, let's, see, let's see what they do, right? Are you guys familiar with the, the uh, disruptive versus sustaining technologies or innovation? You'll learn. All right. <laughs> what I want you to start to think about is when you're looking at your own businesses and you're starting to think about innovation, there's two types of innovation. Uh, that Clay Christensen talked about in particular around disruptive technology or disruptive innovation is disruption has a massive impact on the business that you're trying to apply your technology or your business model to. And my argument is business models are more disruptive than technology is. All right? Sustaining innovation are those incremental changes that customers expect, and disruption is a very new way to handle this issue, and let's look at it from a perspective of Netflix and Blockbuster. So here's what's happening here. I'm going to put it. Blockbuster is on the traditional path. They've, they've gone to retail stores, and when this first started, there were lots and lots of video rental stores, no single brand. Blockbuster consolidated all these to get buying power so they could get scale advantages and purchasing power against the studios who have the content, and they were able to get lower prices for their videos than mom and pop could, the small retail stores. 
And when that happened, all, they just literally squeezed all of the mom and pop shops out of business. And they grew. And so they became the dominant model. And as they become the dominant model, they start to have little innovations. Blockbuster would say, well, we have DVDs. We'll sell popcorn as well. Or we'll sell gaming systems because the kids want to play video games or whatever. Sustaining innovations that the customers expect, right? And so they were in a mature space. And all of a sudden, this DVD got invented, right? We had this thing called a DVD. Did Netflix invent the DVD? No. Did they take advantage of that technology? What can you do with a DVD that you can do with a VHS? You could mail it. You could mail it. The business model innovation that Netflix first took advantage of was they saw this technology and they said, I don't want a retail store. Right? So my, my, the attributes of Blockbuster were they only had, they have a lot of Blockbuster movies. It was spontaneous purchases because it's brick and mortar. As I drive by, I'm like, oh, I want to get a movie. Um, it's brick and mortar retail. I have a per unit rental of $4. And it's kind of like satisfying date night or family night kind of activities. Netflix, when they first came out, they said, well, we can't get Blockbuster hits because we can't afford them. We're going to order online. We're going to deliver by mail. That's a huge difference. But they have the same price, right? And you watch on arrival. You don't get it when you want it. You've got to wait till it gets mailed to you. This initial business model, initial launch, Netflix almost went under. Because if you're a consumer, you have to wait for the thing to get mailed to you. You can't get the good movies. And it costs the same price. And they also had this $2 late fee, which is what the Blockbuster had. So everything was the same, except for you got mailed, it got mailed to you. This was the initial disruption. So with disruptive technologies, though, what happens is, or disruptive innovation is, you see a big gap between where the current innovation levels are with the current tra trajectory, and then you're creating this new concept, new set of attributes. And there's a performance difference normally much worse. And there's normally a bunch of players here who are dealing with these new sets of attributes. The new sets of attributes were really this online modeling order and how do I deal with the information that I can get? And they almost went out of business. But then what happens is they said, OK, wait, we can't do this subscription. $4 is killing us. We can't do it. Our customers don't like it. they got to wait for it. They changed to a all-you-can-eat. Instead of $4 per unit, all-you-can-eat price, $10, and you can get whatever movie you want. They thought they were going to go bankrupt. It happened to make all the difference in the world. First change, slightly better. Right? I'm slightly improving on my new trajectory, right? The second thing they did was they, they came up with this priority, this recommendation system, because they don't have blockbuster movies. So they recommend to you the movies they have, not the movies they don't have. Seems tricky, right? Because you may want to watch the blockbusters. They don't care what you want to watch. They're going to tell you what to watch, right? But it made a big difference. Because the movies they had were a lot cheaper than the blockbuster hits in order for them to rent, right? So it helped them uh, in terms of how many rentals they needed to, to, to actually own in their inventory. The next thing they, re they realized was, if I go online and you put a queue together, and the average queue size is 50 movies, what business wouldn't love to know what their future orders are for sure? And that's what the, this queue system does is it tells them exactly what their future demand is. Gives them a, a tremendous advantage. In fact, Blockbuster, when it came to a Blockbuster movie, had to carry on average, had to buy 500,000 copies of one movie for all the stores they had, 5,000 stores. Netflix only has to buy about 100,000 for that same distribution model. So, this queuing system and some of their other technology allows them to carry way less in just inventory. Primary cost driver is the amount of inventory I have to carry of any one particular movie. And if I have a one, -fifth, one to five advantage over my competition, am I going to kill them? Yeah, if, the, if this is your primary cost driver. Then they, they decided they had, a pro they had a problem, right, is 
they couldn't get their movies overnight. They could get their movies overnight on the East Coast, but they couldn't get their movie, movies overnight on the West Coast. And they realized if they had put a center in Sacramento, they could guarantee overnight delivery. So now the consumers aren't waiting. And that was one of the big problems. So now what you see is on this new trajectory, the, the attributes of expectation of the customer. I'm going to order online. I can set up a queue. I can get subscription pricing. I can get my movie overnight. All of a sudden, my satisfaction goes up. Quickly, Netflix surpasses Blockbuster on this new set of attributes. Blockbuster can't catch up because they've put so much investment into brick and mortar in their inventories. They sink. They're dead. This is business model transformation. What we learn with business model transformation, well, let me do one last thing because I think this is important for you to think about. Every business needs partnerships. Every business. Uh, I want to go back up here, right? Blockbuster, I don't know if they did it in India the same way I would imagine they did. But see these little red envelopes? They were the United States Postal Service number one customer, not Netflix. Their chief operating officer they hired was the postmaster general of the United States Postal Service, the ex-postmaster general. He had great relationships, obviously, with the U.S. Postal Service. They have red envelopes because inside of the U.S. Postal Service, whenever they see a red envelope, it goes into a special bin. Inside of the U.S. Postal Service, not inside of Netflix. Partnerships can be huge in creating advantage. And so look at your business. Look at your business model. Where are partners potentially going to give you an advantage, especially over doing it yourself? And in fact, what would happen is, since we knew where the move, who wanted the movies, if there were movies that were in the post office that were staying in the region, the post office would print the new labels, put them on the envelopes, and actually mail them. They would never go back to Netflix central inventory system. So this allowed them to create huge uh, distribution advantages with the products that they have, right? So there's a lot of things with business model transformation. You're never going to have, you're going to need to continuously monitor what you're doing, and you're going to be changing your business model all the time. It's not like you're going to have one and it's going to be done, right? You're going to be changing it regularly. And I think the most important thing that you guys need to add into your business day one is start to collect data about everything you do. Whether you're selling, how long does it take for a consumer to buy? Um, what are the feedback? How many complaints are you? I mean, collect data on everything because their data collection allowed Netflix to do the next thing, right? Which was these guys. Remember House of Cards? I don't know if you guys, anyone binge on House of Cards? Yes, yeah, someone, yeah, you got a, right? The reason they knew House of Cards was going to be a hit because of all the data they had for their consumers, it matched exactly to the expectations that the consumer had, and so they were able to pick this up. And all, I think uh, Kevin Spacey uh, had pitched this product to 21 studios before Netflix picked it up. But they knew exactly through the data that this was going to be a hit for their clients, for their consumers. Business model transformation needed to continuously improve your model, continuously monitor, continuously test, and validate. And it can create advantages to sustain your, your innovation as you uh, move forward. So I think, uh, you know, for Netflix, what's next? Why did they go to, why did they go to, uh, why did Netflix start to produce their own content? Why did they do that? This goes back to the industry they're in, right? And this is where you really need to understand what your industry is about. Who has the power in the entertainment industry? Content owners, right? Anyone who owns content has power. So what happened was Netflix had contracts with the content owners, the, stu the big studios, and they were up for renewal. The studio said, Netflix, you're, you're taking too much money from us, so we're going to raise the price. They raised the price 3x. So what it used to cost Netflix, $1 would cost them $3 just to get access to movies. Big cost driver. Netflix initially, before the contract expired, didn't want to create their own content because they were afraid it would make their suppliers of the movies mad. 
and they would stop supplying them and they'd supply them through some other channel. Once the contract price went up, Netflix said, well, I'm not worried about making you mad anymore because you're already taking advantage of it. I need to create my own content to continue to create an advantage. So their strategy became, I, I don't know if you know uh, HBO, but Hulu has the same strategy as Netflix. And they wanted, Netflix basically said, we want to become HBO before HBO becomes us because of the distribution channel issues. So think of your industries, they're always evolving, they're always gonna be changing and you need to be in front of those issues. Data collections is gonna be a great way for you from the beginning to start to predict what kind of changes you might be facing as you move forward. All right, 10, that was almost 10 minutes. Um, I think that's all I got, yes. Thank you very much, I, I hope. <laughs> I'm, I'm sweating up here. I hope you learned at least one thing. I would look at the pages that you wrote and there's some opportunities to start to think about your business, hopefully in a few different ways than you might have before you came in here. Um, if you have any additional questions, please make sure you ask them, whether it's, if, even if it's about your business and applying some of the concepts you've heard today. Um, these are some of the kind of things that we will be teaching in our VDDCs, VDDP. Uh, models. Uh, I do a series of lectures along with some of my colleagues. Um, hopefully it was informative. It's been my pleasure to get a chance to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to request the dignitaries to, dignitaries to join for tea. Uh, I have uh, a few Does the does an undergraduate have the ability to participate in and under, undertake this particular program? I, I think you're referring to the venture development program and some of the programs that, um, my, this question is from Mahendra Kumar. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we have this program for uh, the third and final year of engineering. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, both the first and second years of MBA. Um, and uh, MCA, the final and pre-final years of uh, MCA. Uh, that's what we are doing right now because we have to start somewhere. Uh, by undergraduate, I don't know if you meant engineering or you meant uh, the liberal arts, is it BA, BCom, uh, is that what the question was? Uh, by undergraduate, I'm, I'm assuming that to be engineering. You, you, you mean BCom, uh, uh, that's, that's the liberal arts, BCom, BA, BSc. MBA, yes. Oh, BBA, you, you, you meant BBA. BBA, uh, final year of BBA, I think we have, we have considered. Uh, no, we, we did not consider final year of BBA. BBM and BBA, we didn't consider final years. No, I, I believe for now we are not offering it to BBA or BBM uh, students um, because you know there's uh, uh, the, some of the material that you go through needs uh, a, a level of uh, understanding, a level of maturity uh, and you know it, we make a general assumption obviously some BBA, BBM students may be uh, at that high, high level of uh, understanding but we're just making a general assumption uh, that it requires an MBA level uh, MBA level studies uh, to comprehend what is uh, taught. So that initially that's what we are keeping it for and eventually the goal is to open it up for other students also, okay? Uh, go ahead, you want to answer one, another question, uh, Greg? Uh, no. Ken. Right, this question is, uh, I think it's an interesting question. What is, what is the way to combat disruptive I just do that. Now you can hear me, right? Yeah. All right, so how do we uh, combat disruptive technologies? Uh, you know, you either buy them, you try to develop them quickly or faster than the competition, or you run and hide. There's, it, it, once disruptive technologies, those attributes of performance, start to become accepted in the, in the market, if you have not made the shift, you either buy it 
or you kind of give up. There, you, there's no other way. You can't, uh, you, I mean, I guess you could try to go jump, leapfrog, and sometimes we'll see that where you come up with the technology after that or the innovation after that. But uh, if you haven't done it, uh, your old business is at risk. So if you look at um, Blockbuster, they died. They couldn't, they couldn't innovate to the next level. If they had jumped into uh, maybe video on demand immediately, uh, they might have survived what they did. So once, once it's adopted, it's really, really hard to stop, stop it from happening. So um, pretty much impossible. OK, um, the next question uh, is from uh, Abhishek. Uh, you're providing gap fund to the students, so in case the idea does not work properly in long term, um, then uh, then what happens? I think that's uh, the gist of his question. So it doesn't matter. Uh, gap fund is uh, a fund that's available to you uh, if you're qualified to receive that uh, fund. This is seed funding for. Uh, uh, for carrying on your business, and if it business for whatever reasons, external reasons, internal reasons, it doesn't take off or it doesn't uh, mature into into a venture, uh, so be it. Uh, that's the cost of learning. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the we're going to ask you to pay that money back. No, it, it's investment in the in the venture, and as we are giving that money, there is risk involved, and in any business, there's risk involved. Instead of you taking the risk. The, we are from the GAP Fund Committee, we are taking the risk and giving you the money. Uh, after checking out that uh, now you have uh, uh, all the sincerity and all uh, the passion to, uh, to develop that venture. And after, one of the reasons you, you cite here is because of technology or because of trends and changes in market. It could be regulation might have changed, the government might have changed some rules because of that the business that you you, you think would be uh, a great success, may not take off, uh, that's okay. Uh, don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to, to uh, take a no for an answer. Uh, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. These are, these are things that you need to have as an entrepreneur. This, uh, you, you have to say you don't know and you, know, you, you learn from it. If someone turns you down, don't get frustrated, uh, you go at it again. If uh, one of your ideas hasn't, hasn't really progressed the way you wanted it to, that's okay. Uh, you, you need to, in a, every failure, if you call it a failure, uh, there is uh, things to learn. There are, there are you know, a lot of things you learn from a, a failure. So if you define uh, learning is success, then failure is not a failure. Failure is a success also. Okay, so don't be, don't be, don't be so worried. All right, um, this is a good question. Uh, I would say your name, but I can't pronounce it. I apologize. Uh, as you mentioned, don't penetrate or uh, don't pen um, penetrate into the market by reducing your price. What is your opinion upon this strategy used by Reliance Geo, which was a freemium model for the 4G market? It looks like. Um, so pricing strategy is really interesting. Pricing. Uh, your pricing strategy is, should be in line with your strategy, right? So you may decide to enter a market with a freemium model. Give it away. You may in, be you may be interested in um, pricing at what we call skimming, which is high priced and capturing profits from early adopters as quickly as you can. Depending on your strategy, if you want to get to a scale market, if your goal is to get to a large scale inside of the market, so be a broad market or industry player, then you might choose an approach that is either a scaling option where you're going to price low and hopefully once you get to market demand, then you can start to find ways to charge the customer uh, because you own most of the market. Or like in consumer electronics where technology keeps replacing itself quickly over time, we'll use skimming pricing strategies because we want to get the early adopters to pay you know, $5,000 for a TV that in a year or two is going to be $500, right? So depending on your strategy, your pricing will fall. So it, it makes sense. Uh, either one can make sense. There's no right or wrong. Um, my comment was basically based on if you're creating value, then you should try to capture that value potentially before giving up on price, right? OK, I have a two-part question here from uh Aditya Akhilesh uh, of GVP College. Uh, how to develop 
risk taking ability how do you develop risk taking ability uh, and uh, what factors do investors look for uh, when putting money in a business uh, good 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 questions uh, uh, there's really uh, how how do you develop you don't develop a risk taking uh, ability uh, what you do is uh, you recognize the risks in a business in an operation that uh, you're going to undertake you recognize what the risks are and try to mitigate them as much as possible uh, try to reduce the risk as much as possible by taking so many uh, you know steps but uh, in spite of that there's always inherent risk in any uh, any business uh, so that's why there's always a reward at the end if you take the risk there's a reward so there are so many unknowns you make assumptions when you as an entrepreneur as when you're building a business you make a number of assumptions many things are not known until until you actually uh, they take the dive and start building but to the extent you know the risks you have to mitigate the risks and as you progress as you come to know more and more uh, uh, risks you know you have to have a strategy where uh, you're constantly monitoring what uh, your risks are and constantly taking steps to to mitigate them so absolutely there is going to be a a risk that that's why it's uh, 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 that's why you're an entrepreneur and there is also an equally uh, rewarding uh, outcome at the end as you take the risks and uh, go with it um, what factors do investors look for in uh, when they when they put money in 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 a company well if as an investor if i'm putting money in your company i'm really not putting money in the company i'm putting money in you the team what team is behind this idea so about you what are your abilities how much how much can i trust you in terms of your ability your passion to carry the business forward so it is you that the investors are investing in not as much the business so you have when we evaluate you we look for your passion how much you know about the business that you're getting into how passionate are you about this business uh, how much uh, uh, how much do, do you believe in the business yourself and what type of team have you built have you assembled to uh, bring this bring this business forward uh, of course we're going to look at the business idea and the business plan and you know there's all those things that we talked about your financial projections and all of that but all that aside i think the biggest if you want me to name one single most important factor it is you so because we investing in you not in not as much in the business very good there are a lot of good questions so it's uh, kind of hard to pick through these um i'm going to pick this one because it's my favorite name neha yay i love the name um from my perspective what is it that what is the one quality a person should possess in order to be successful i'm i'm are we talking about successful in life or are we talking about successful business um, I, they're probably related i suppose I, i i find that most of the the people who um i've met who are successful they have a couple of common attributes uh i think the first one is they perpetually question things they're never satisfied with the answer there's perpetually asking and cur- it's not questioning to be counter uh kind of defensive it's questioning to be open and learn and i think if if you learn how to ask really great great questions um you'll find a a, a lot of value and success i think in in the ability to to kind of open your mind and and apply those uh, the other thing and i'm going to tie this specifically to uh new ventures every new venture reaches a point where you will everyone everyone who's watching including you know you're going to fail every venture and it's when you meet that point of failure that you decide what you're going to do and this is when you're you're it's really a gut check it's kind of a, a check of your own ability to persevere because every venture hits what i call the the uh, valley of despair and the, and every venture who succeeds figures out to get across it And so when you get to that point do you have the ability to be creative and think differently to try to solve that problem that's creating that despair in that moment 
and are you open to take input and find a way? And most ventures fail at that moment because they give up. It has nothing to do with how good or bad the business idea is, it's they don't know how to persevere and deal with that moment in, of truth. And that, that's what I think uh, creates the, the success. Okay, um, I have the next question. Uh, feel free to write out if you have more questions, you know, write them down and uh, pass them around. Uh, We'll, we'll answer them to the extent we have time. Uh, this question is uh, from Aniket Karmakar. Uh, if there is uh, an app with complex user interfaces, but serves a large number of customers as well as it requires high production cost, as a student, how to overcome this problem? So I think you're, you're talking about investments. If uh, you think you have uh, a, a product, uh, or a solution that is very complex and requires a lot of investment uh, because it's a huge production cost. Uh, I don't have the money. Uh, that, that's what I'm reading into this. Uh, how, how do you overcome, overcome this? Uh, again, uh, as we said earlier, don't think about uh, investments at this stage. We, we don't know you, the, the, the idea that you have, the product that you want to build, or the solution that you want to provide. We don't know how uh, the accept, acceptance of that product or solution in the market is going to be. So you will find out. Because uh, right now you're thinking about a product sitting in your uh, hostel room or in the classroom or in the, within the four walls. So you have to really go out and validate it, uh, do uh, uh, the market analysis and customer service, and go through the ready stage that we mentioned. If you at the end of the ready stage, that's when you will know really how complex it is or how simple it may be or uh, how much investment you may need is something that you would, you would know later. You won't know that, know that now. You, you may think you know, but you really don't know today. So you, need, you don't need to worry about that at this early stage. All right. Uh, I think this is a great question. So I'm going to give you, this is like my area of expertise. Uh, so I'll give you a specific answer. How do you advertise your product or service and how do you advertise your business? I think everyone wants to know that. And this is your go-to-market strategy. I will tell you today, if you do not have a well-defined digital marketing plan as part of your go-to-market strategy, um, then you're probably not going to succeed. So let me give you a few ideas on, on digital marketing strategies. One of the things you want to do is uh, you need to know who your customer is. You need to know where they gather information. So if my consumers are online and they're, they're, they like to get their news on, on a news network and that's where your consumers are, then you need to be there giving them a message. Another thing you need to do is have a blog or some form of content strategy that you have. It's about, not about your company, but it's about thought and about um, intelligence around your arena of business and you want to get other sites to pick up or link to your content whom are also reaching your audience and you need a content strategy that covers you need a messaging strategy that covers at least six months with at least one or two types or two um, different topics every month and every time you reach out you need a call to action. So every time you're publishing content, every time you're creating a link, you want to get information from the consumers, and if you can get their email address, it's gold. Because the minute you have their email address, you have an interested consumer in what you're talking about. And it's better, we can go and buy email, address, email uh, addresses from lots of sources, but these are specifically interested and expressed interest in your company. If you can do that, you're gonna be a long way ahead when it comes to, especially in a B2C model. Uh, but you can even do, do this with B2B uh, for your buying community. But digital content strategy, content management strategy, if you don't have that in your plan now, start to work on it. Okay, uh, the next question is from Saucelia. Uh, what are the steps to start a venture? Uh, well, uh, to start a venture, uh, I can tell you what you don't need. You don't need money, as I said earlier. Uh, you, you will take your venture idea, 
uh, go through the ready stage that uh, I mentioned. We call it the ready stage, you know, different people might call it different uh, names. But what you really need to do is validate your idea uh, before you jump in to start manufacturing or start thinking about uh, selling uh, or thinking about raising money. You really need to validate the business idea uh, with the kind of things that we talked about, uh, market analysis uh, or uh, uh, custom and customer surveys. So that's what you would uh, do before you dive into it. So that's really where you start. And you will have to spend a lot of time in that, in that phase. You need to really have uh, a solid understanding of uh, what market you're entering, who is going to be your customer, before you start doing anything about it. All right, uh, another really good question. S. Jatin, excellent question actually. Many startups start with a team of sm a small group of people on their team, uh, and they scale up gradually, so you're slowly growing. And, and in his view, and I've seen it as well, uh, a lot of startups fail, or they may stagnate. They may not fail, but they don't move any further uh, because they don't know how to scale up. And I think this is a huge issue uh, for most firms, is how do you actually move from one level of performance to an exponential level of performance? Typically, the reason you aren't doing it as an initial startup because you don't have the skill set to do it. And so normally what will happen is when you reach that point where you need to scale exponentially, you need a leadership change, and that might be you. A lot of CEOs or founders try to scale themselves. They don't have the experience. Let's say you want to move from one country to the next, and if you have never done business outside of your home country, you don't have the ability to do it. You can try to learn those skills, but it's really difficult. So two things I would suggest. When you reach that point to scale exponentially, look at the leadership team and the skills you need to do it. Do you have those or not? And then hire appropriately to build them. The second thing you might want to do if you don't want to lose your own job or, or reclassify yourself is to look at partnerships. And partnerships, just like we looked at even with Netflix and we looked at with, there's, I mean, we can look at a lot of companies and they find distributors in other areas who can take your product and move it further along. There's a lot of different ways to scale up. You need to think about, do you have the skills to do that? And if you don't, hire them or find partners who do. And that's a great way to, to uh, accelerate quite quickly. Thank you. Uh, Greg, I think you have. I have some, all right. Let's see, I have a nice one over here. Okay, uh, I can take the next question. This is, uh, does Northeastern University give a certificate for the Perspectives and Entrepreneurship Program? Uh, yes, a certificate. Uh, all of the programs that we have advertised here um, come, up, come with a certificate. Uh, for completion, for successful completion. Uh, the certificate is given jointly by APSSDC and Northeastern University. And if you complete the uh, BDDP, right, yes, the, you, get a, you actually get credit from North, you get a class right. credit from Northeastern University. So it'd be the equivalent yeah. of yeah, one let, let, class. Yes. Which let, is about a $5,000 value if you take thanks. that course at, in the US. So, um, so if you complete that, that's uh, a nice thing. All right, um, I like this question. If uh, in the present economy, uh, in what industries are investors more interested in to invest? So uh, let me give you an idea about investors. You can find investors in almost every industry you can think of. So uh, in fact, it's really important as you start, once you, once you get to that point where you're looking for money, make sure you go to the right type of investor. You don't want to go to an investor who likes to invest in software companies if you've got a hardware product, right? So I think there are investors in, in anything that you'd like to do. Healthcare industries, there are investors. In fact, it's a great arena if, if you were interested in uh, looking at a, a, an industry to pursue changes in healthcare, I think are becoming fast and furious. Biotechnology is a huge arena right now. Alternative energies is a huge arena right now. Data analytics underneath all of those is a huge arena right now. So I think there's some big 
uh, industry sector kinds of trends that are going on. Um, but more importantly, when you do decide to reach out for investment, make sure the investors you're looking at are interested in the industry you're interested in. Find them, they're out there. Okay. Uh, how to, how do you remain competitive in this world? Uh, I think that's, that's what the essence of this question is. How do you, uh, how do you remain competitive? Let's say you have, you start a business, uh, uh, you, you constantly monitor your competition, uh, but how do you remain competitive? That's a, that's a great question. Many companies uh, uh, lose their competitive edge because they're, they're not listening to the customers anymore. So it, it is very, very, very important that not only do you do your initial validation of your idea with your customers, but in order to remain in business, you have to be in constant touch with your customers. Their, their buying habits might have changed. There may be other competitors that, am, that might have come in. The circumstances, the technologies might have changed. The living, living uh, uh, styles might have changed. So these are the things that will make customers change their behavior. So what they might have found uh, attractive in your product uh, a few months ago or last year, they may not find that any longer relevant for their, for their life. So you have to stay in constant touch with your customer and to be prepared to make changes to your own product and uh, solutions based on what the customer is looking for. Uh, it's not uh, it's not enough if you just sit in your offices or sit in your labs and assume that this is what the customer would need. So that's, that's how you would uh, stay competitive uh, and keep that competitive edge uh, as, you, as you build your business. I, th I think we have time for one more question each. Uh, yes, please. Yep. Yeah. All right. So I, I, I saved this question intentionally. I think it's one of the, I think one of the most meaningful questions that I've, I think I'm facing in terms of as I look at industry changes and trends, I think is an important issue for India as well. Uh, it definitely, we're seeing a lot of this uh, kind of impact in the United States. The question is, um, what are the special challenges that women entrepreneurs face apart from the men? It's a sad thing that we have to ask this question. Are there any special subsidies and advantages to raise capital and so on from state or national governments? So we got to stop this, guys. You know, women and men. I, I, my students, when I when I when I uh, focus on on just pure talent and look at opportunities, uh, the women have brought forward some of the most brilliant ideas. I have several uh, programs that I'm working on in uh, at Northeastern with ventures that are being led by women. Um, women women bring a broad range of skills and capabilities that are necessary for all, all of us to adopt. And we need to pay attention to those. It's a big challenge today, and I understand the challenge. We've seen a lot of issues that go on, and I think the best we can do is try to uh, allow, and you know, as best we can. I mean, I think women who can start to take control, can start to lead, uh, build their own venture funds and venture capital funds, look at the kinds of opportunities that women are, are specifically trying to address. I think if you can take some of that control, uh, don't look for anyone else. I mean, you know, you have to look to yourselves really to solve these kind of issues. And as you do, you'll start to demonstrate that you have as much, if not more, uh, to bring to the table, especially in entrepreneurship, than we might otherwise by just focusing on having the men and the gentlemen who've been kind of stuck in a rut on, on how these things might be working. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest is one, one of the things that I see a lot of compassion for, especially with women entrepreneurs, are social entrepreneurship endeavors. Uh, and, and a lot of investors are looking at social entrepreneurship as a key area for uh, investment and growth, uh, solving some of the bigger problems that we have in, uh, around the world. And I do see a, a predominance of uh, of uh, some of the ladies focusing on these endeavors as well. I think, uh, I think if you just keep pushing on it, I, I'm starting to sense and see change. Uh, the more we see leadership 
uh, from the women, taking control, uh, in particular with funds, uh, the more, more uh, I think uh, you'll start to see a difference in your, own, in your own lives here. So take the lead, be successful and start a fund and, and start to promote and, and, and get other women out there. I, I just want to add to what uh, Professor Collier just said about women entrepreneurship before I take up my next question. Uh, don't ever think that you are inferior in any way. You are as good as, if not better than, your counterparts. I tell you why. Uh, the trends we see in entrepreneurship today, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, there was uh, last month, early, early in December, not last month, actually in December, we had this uh, global uh, entrepreneurship summit uh, that was held in Hyderabad. Uh, do you, have you heard about it? Uh, who was the chief guest? Ivanka Trump, yes, that's how you remember it. So I was there at that event, uh, and she led a delegation from uh, the US. There were 3,800 uh, entrepreneurs that joined that event that day uh, in Hyderabad. It's an event that's conducted once a year, and they keep moving from one country to another country, and uh, this year it happened to be India, and it happened to be Hyderabad. Uh, the 38, out of the 3,800 global entrepreneurs that assembled in the room that day, slightly more than 50% were women. So uh, that, that can give you a sense of uh, the women power. And my own, my own investments, I've invested in a, in a few companies, uh, and it's exactly, I was trying to recollect, uh, it's exact 50% of the businesses I've invested in are women businesses, are, are actually uh, headed by women entrepreneurs, and the 50% are by men entrepreneurs. So it is always a level, level playing field. Don't ever think that you are, uh, no, let's actually you, if anything, you're much smarter than your counterparts, okay? Uh, so that, uh, you keep, keep, keep it up. You, you, sh you should, you, you will succeed and you will definitely be as successful as, if not more successful than your, uh, the men. Uh, the question I'm going to answer here is, uh, I'm planning to be in the automobile market uh, what will be the best way to collect uh, requirements uh, of an automobile customer? Should I go to uh, the customers directly or go to the showrooms? Uh, again, it depends on the product or solution that you're trying to build. Are you trying to build a, a solution for the end customer? Then you need to collect data from the end customer directly. And uh, what role does a showroom have, uh, the dealer have uh, in, in, in your business? you want to collect information from the dealer dealer also if that's if the dealer plays a role in your in your solution it, it, so first you need to your idea you need to identify what tar, what's your target customer what's the best use case scenario uh, are you trying to sell to uh, 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 men of a certain age in a certain geography or are you trying to sell to uh, let's say a retired person living in uh, a rural area. So you need to determine who the end user uh, is going to be for your product. Then you segment it, you narrow it down. You want to be as narrow as possible. And then go collect information from that uh, segment. Uh, even though I said uh, that was the last question, there's just one small um, piece of information uh, someone is looking for. Is there an email or a website uh, if I want to upload a new business idea? Uh, do we have uh, the site, the link still on the site? It's been taken down. Um, uh, this is what I suggest. Whoever wants to uh, submit a business idea, uh, because we, we have the program that's starting, and uh, to enter the program, the prerequisite is a business idea. So if you have business ideas, I suggest you send an email to us at uh, i2e at apssdc.in. Just send, send an email saying that you have a business idea that you want to submit. Provide your contact information in the email. And we will uh, uh, we, we'll work with you. We'll, we'll, uh, I think there's a way to send you a link. Uh, the link was available um, on the website until, until two days ago. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, uh, yeah, the email is on, on these. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, the email that you see on the left bottom left corner 
uh, that's a website, right? I t no, that's an email. I can barely read it. Uh, I'm, I'm old. I can't read. Um, but uh, uh, but no, I2E, I2E at APSSDC.in. That's where you want to send an email, send a request for what you want to do. You send in your uh, contact information. Someone will get in touch with you and figure out a way to get your idea into, into the system. Well, very good. Thank you very much for your patience. I know we've... Uh, We, we've kept you here longer than planned, uh, but I hope you don't mind that. You have a beautiful uh, evening and uh, have a great career and be entrepreneurs one day or the other. So uh, that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, sirs. Now I request Manjusha ma'am to propose the vote of thanks. Good evening. Yes, still you have energy or not? Yes. Okay. So officially, when someone says it is vote of thanks, that is the end of the program. Okay. So it is just two minutes. I'll be taking your time, and then you can enjoy. So good evening once again. Good evening, guests, faculty, and students. It gives me immense pleasure to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Geetham Institute of Management, Geetham University, the hosting partner of this workshop, Business Model Innovations Current Drivers. First, I like to thank the Geetham President and Vice Chancellor of Geetham University and also the Pro Vice Chancellor for Sir K. S. Ramakrishna Sir for the support and encouragement for conducting this workshop. First, I like to express my sincere thanks to the dis distinguished guest, Mr. P. N. Krishna Garu for sharing his thoughts that entrepreneurs are not born but entrepreneurs can be made uh, or trained. This is true because all entrepreneurs, if they are born, we have only a handful of entrepreneurs. So if they are trained, we can find so many entrepreneurs. And this is what is very much required for the current day. I thank Mr. Raka Sinha for informing the gathering about the various courses offered for the trainers training programs by APSSCD. I'd like to thank Professor Greg Collier for highlighting on that Entrepreneurship is a team, but not an individual. Sir, your session was very interesting because you focused on business model, strategy, and customer value proposition. Anywhere in the world, anyone tries to do any activity based on this one important concept that is customer value proposition. Without customer, without satisfaction, nothing can be achieved. So thank you very much, sir. And one more sincere thanks. You made my uh, session and my next course very easy because this trimester, we do have entrepreneurship course. And all the fundamentals were taught excellently with good, excellent examples. Thank you very much, sir. I also thank Professor P. Sheila, Principal Githam Institute of Management for helping us to conduct this program. And also I thank the press, media, non-teaching staff and my faculty for supporting us. Last but not the least, all the students from the four districts, Srikakulam, Vijayanagaram, West Godavari and Vishakapatnam and also the faculty from all the colleges for making this event a fruitful and a grand success. Thank you. And any event of this kind, again, we welcome you all to participate and take a lots of hopeful information for your future. Thank you. Thank you.